Carolina This Week with Tim McGinnis. Good morning and thanks for joining us for Carolina This Week. Of course, elections are right around the corner. November 6th will be here before you know it. We've got the presidential race, but in our area, we also have the 7th Congressional District race. Last week, we heard from the Democrat, Gloria Brabell Tanubu. This week, Tom Rice, the Republican in the race joins us. Thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me, Tim. I should also say Horry County Council Chairman. And the last time, one of the last times you were here was we were sitting at this table to debate before the runoff with uh, Andre Bauer. You took the runoff, and now you're heading in toward the general election. How have uh, how ha how has your campaign changed going from primary into general? Well, I, you know, when you're running as one of nine Republicans and it's a little harder to distinguish yourself from the positions of the others, but uh, in this case, I think there's a really vast difference between our positions. So I don't think it's nearly as hard to uh, to find a, uh, a difference. I think there might be vast differences in the way you approach some of the things, but I think the big issues are the same no matter which side of the aisle you're on, and that's the economy, jobs. We're talking about how big the seventh congressional district is, stretching from Georgetown all the way into Marlboro County, up on the floor, on, up on the North Carolina border. And a, we see that Marion has the highest unemployment rate in the state as far as counties go. Marlboro not far behind. Even here in Horry County and in Georgetown County, the unemployment rate is still above the national unemployment rate of 8.3 percent. So this is an area hit hard by the recession. How are you going to work from Washington? to create jobs back here? I think there's, you know, a, a number of ways to do that. Uh, uh, you know, what you said earlier, though, I think is not quite right in that, yeah, ma maybe we think the issues are the same, but uh, my opponent thinks that big government is the answer and that big government will solve all our problems. And I, I, I don't believe that. I don't think that's what's made America great. I think that, uh, a private enterprise is what's going to have to step up and solve the problems, and I don't think growing government is going to get us anything but more bureaucracy and more stalemate. Um, what I would do with respect to jobs is two things. Uh, nationally, I think that the government has uh, over-regulated and overtaxed our businesses to the point that they're just not competitive. They can't be competitive. You know, the, the world has shrunk. <laughs> it's become a much smaller place. And many, many businesses that compete worldwide can choose to operate here, or they can choose to operate in South America or France or India or wherever they want to. And what they're going to do is they're going to operate in the place where they can, a most business friendly environment and where they can make the most profit. And here, where we've got, you know, one of the highest corporate tax rates in the world, uh, and also where we regulate our business to such an extent that it, it costs a lot of money that uh, we almost force them overseas, you know. But it, it, they can't compete with their, with their uh, compatriots across the sea. So I, I think that's one thing we've really got to look at is cutting back on regulation and, and having a uh, pro-growth tax policy uh, that, that allows business to compete worldwide. And, you know, we've been, we've been hemorrhaging American jobs for decades. Uh, we've been sitting here watching it happen and saying, why is this happening? And cheap labor, yeah, I know that's part of it. But uh, also, it's the government is, is really not a facilitator. They're an obstacle. You know, I, I go in businesses across this district and uh, talk to the workers. I talk to the employers. And uh, I say, do you see the government as a facilitator of your business or, some, or an obstacle you have to get across? And it's about that, top of the, uh, about th that time that the top of their head blows off. And, they go off on what they have to deal with with the government and, and you know we didn't used to be that way. What are some <laughs> they, specific they, regulations they used to that call, you would get away, you, you do away with? They used to call America industrious. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, they, don't, they don't do that anymore. Uh, you know we, we've got if we want the jobs we've got to be job friendly. If we want to put working Americans back to work we've got to be job friendly. It's like we did here in Horry County. You know when, when I came in I, I ran on jobs. And we sat down and we looked at uh, what we needed to do to become competitive, because we weren't. You know, historically, what we did was we said, okay, if somebody wants to locate here, great. But, you know, uh, we're, we're all about tourism, and tourism is great, and we've got to continue to grow that. But uh, uh, we didn't really go out courting businesses. We didn't really market ourselves to businesses or, or really work to get them here. 
Well, we've changed that attitude in a year and a half, and it's already paying off. You know, uh, we were producing 106 jobs a year outside of tourism uh, uh, in the three years before I became chairman of county council. And since we've put this Economic Development Corporation in place, and this year we've produced uh, 300 or so jobs that the EDC's come up with, and 200 jobs with this new target development, and uh, 50 jobs with that call center in March. I mean, we're over 500 jobs so far this year. We've quadrupled the job production in Horry County, and a lot of that was change in attitude with the local government. And I think we can take that same thing to the national level. And, and then w with respect to the district, bringing jobs into this district, one thing I've said throughout that I plan to bring somebody with economic development experience onto my congressional staff. And I want to help, I want to work with these counties, I want to work with their economic development authorities, I want to work with NISA, and uh, I want to see if we can come up with a, a plan and market this area and enhance what NISA is already doing. Uh, and, and if we work together, I think we can attract more business here. And third, I want to be the, uh, I want to be the marketer for this district because we really do have a lot to offer. And we've got to take advantage of, of what we have. You know, we've got a port in Georgetown. We've got a 9,500-foot mil military-grade runway sitting here in Myrtle Beach. We've got... Uh, uh, Two interstates, they don't have them here in, in Horry County or Georgetown County or Marion, but Dillon and Florence and Marlboro and we, we do have interstates in Darlington, we, we do have interstate access and so there's a lot that we can sell. I do want to talk interstates in a minute, but back to the question, specifically regulations. Which regulations do you think need to be addressed in Washington that are hurting businesses and private enterprise here? Well, uh, you know, I can name a number of them, but uh, for example, in the last four years, regulations that we've piled on. Uh, the uh, Dodd-Frank law that, uh, that uh, regulates our banks. You know, essentially, the government is making loan decisions now. You know, they've blocked small banks from being able to pr provide capital to our small businesses at a time that they need it the worst. <laughs> you know, the law supposedly prevents, uh, it, it's supposed to keep banks from becoming too big to fail. But actually, the only banks that can afford to comply with the regulations are the big banks. So what it's going to do is going to kill the small banks. And small banks are what our small business needs. That's one. Uh, and you know, when, when they don't have access to the capital, they're less competitive. They can't compete with their competitors across the sea, and more American jobs go overseas. Uh, you know, when, when Obama came in and tried to pass cap and trade, and he couldn't get it through a Democratic House and a Democratic Senate, too liberal for them. So he went to the EPA and he said, tighten up your regulations, okay? <laughs> the Granger coal plant in Conway is closing down. The coal plant in Darlington is closing down. He's cutting off coal, which is our cheapest fuel source, as one of our available fuel sources. In, well, what happens when you cut off one fuel source? The price of the other fuel sources go up. Gas is $4 a gallon. Wow, how'd that happen, <laughs> you know? Now, it costs more to manufacture here. Our, our companies are less competitive. Guess what? More American jobs go overseas. Obamacare. What do you think that's going to do to the cost of doing business? I mean, tens of thousands of pages of additional regulations they're going to have to deal with, 2,000 more uh, IRS agents. I'm not even talking about the merits of the government taking over health care. I'm talking about what it's going to do to our small business. Drives cost up, <laughs> makes them less competitive worldwide, more American jobs go overseas. Uh, the, you know, this fiscal cliff that we're facing in January, an amazing thing probably the biggest tax hike that we've had in 50 years, maybe ever. When you look at the Bush tax cuts expiring, the, the payroll tax cuts expiring, the sequestration, the, the uh, taxes under the Obamacare, uh, Obamacare law beginning to kick in, uh, huge, huge drag on the economy. Every economist in the world is saying, you know, it's going to put you in a recession, no doubt about it. It's the most predictable thing that's going to happen. We're going into recession. <laughs> you, you know it's going to happen come January. What are they doing about it? What are they doing about it? Nothing. <laughs> uh, I mean, it, it seems to me uh, that this administration has done more to kill jobs than any administration in my lifetime, uh, ship more American jobs overseas. So there's a list of things that I would want to deal with to get, get the government off the backs of American business. And we will be debating these issues. I want to remind everybody on October 17th, so we'll hear both sides of those arguments, I'm sure, that night. And I want to talk to you about I-73. We were talking interstates just a few minutes ago. 
I-73 in the almost four years I've been here, I've always, I was told we're real close to getting it when I first got here. In fact, we'll have it in the next couple years. You'll be driving on it. Mm -hmm. We're not driving on it yet. Mm -hmm. There's not really, except for a little scratch the surface work, no work has been done on I-73. Mm -hmm. As a freshman congressman, who I know supports I-73, mm -hmm. especially coming to the beach, mm -hmm. how are you going to make that happen? You're absolutely wrong. There's been a lot of work done on I-73. Okay. I what, Correct or, me. <laughs> Horry, Horry County, Horry County mm -hmm. has built 28 miles of I-73. It's called Highway 22, mm -hmm. and it goes from the coast out to Ainer. <laughs> and what we need is another 41 miles or so to connect with uh, I-95. Uh, uh, that 41 miles, uh, there's a lot of work to be done. And, you know, one reason I think why more hadn't been done in the last four years is because we've obviously been in a severe downturn and governments from local governments all up to the U.S. government obviously don't have the, the uh, cash flow that they had at one time. But no, that road is desperately needed. Uh, you know, earmarks are gone. Everybody recognizes that. But uh, that doesn't mean that we're going to stop maintaining and building infrastructure. Of course we are. We're going to become a third world country. Everybody else is going to pass us by. So we've got to continue to build on our infrastructure. It's going to be a matter of merit. Democrats would argue that building infrastructure is stimulating the economy, is taking care of all of this at one time. Do you see building infrastructure and maintaining infrastructure as something that the government needs to do? or? How do you get the private industry involved in that? Okay, well, let, let me finish answering the first question. Sure. I'll come back to that. Um, uh, and, I, and I forgot where I was. Uh, oh, uh, you know, it's a question of merit and question of allocating limited dollars for con, uh, construction of infrastructure. Uh, you know, we can't do it. We can't be building frivolous projects like the bridge to nowhere in Alaska. We've got to have, do things that have merit. Now, how do you allocate that merit? Well. You know, I think that's to be determined. I think that's an issue that Congress has to face. Uh, either Congress is going to determine that merit or they're going to turn it over to other areas of the government. And I'm not comfortable with that. I think Congress should make that determination. But uh, Congress has recognized the merit of I-73. They did it 25 years ago. Now, nothing has happened, but they recognize it as one of the top national projects 25 years ago. And we're, you know, we're one of the top three tourist destinations in the country, us in Orlando and Las Vegas. And uh, the fact that we have 14 million people driving in here, 90% coming, excuse me, coming in here annually, 90% driving and 75% coming off I-95, pretty much speaks for itself to me. And not to mention the fact the huge economic boost it would provide to Marion County, Dillon County, and Marlboro, these counties that you, know, you specifically mentioned mm -hmm. that are among the highest unemployment in the state. Sure. Let's take a quick break. When we come back, we'll talk a little bit about world affairs and whatever else we can think of. Sounds great. Stay with us. We'll be right back with Tom Rice running for the 7th Congressional District. We'll be right back. <coughs> Welcome back to Carolina this week. Tom Rice, the Republican running for the 7th Congressional District, is my guest this morning. I want to let everybody know last week we had Gloria Bramel Tinubu on here. And, uh, we'll be po I'll be posting those uh, the video for both of these on carolinalive.com here in the next 48 hours or so. I want to talk to you now about world affairs. We see what's happening overseas right now. Lots of demonstrations against America because of this video that was made. And then we had the incursion in Libya that killed one of our diplomats that may have been really looking like it was an act of terrorism and not of a mob gone wild. How, do you, how would you want to see the administration and how would you want to see the government approach the Middle East right now? And as a congressman, how, how would your votes go when it comes down to uh, to funding different things overseas right now? Well, uh, I think we're in a, we're in a difficult spot. Uh, I doubt that that video was really the source of these issues that we're facing in the Middle East. I think that uh, these problems stem more from the fact that we, if we have a far, foreign policy, it's difficult to discern. I think the, uh, that America has always been a leader in, in the world, and I think we're we haven't been real present in that role in the last four years, and that uh, we need to we need to be uh, more of a leader. Uh, we we need to have a more defined foreign policy, and uh, uh, I hope that we can work our way through this without having the lid blow off and having real real bad problems over there. If it came down to it, and this is a hypothetical, I'm just going to throw out there. But if it came down to it, and 
the CIA came to Congress and said, we have evidence that Iran has a nuclear weapon. And if the president came to you and said, I need your support to go to war with Iran to stop them from going nuclear on Israel or any other country, how do you think you'd vote? How would, what, would, what would your struggle be? That's a difficult question uh, when, you, when you're faced with the country going to war. But I don't think we can allow Iran to have nuclear weapons. Uh, you know, I, I think that they're a declared enemy of this country. I think they're a declared enemy of the Israel. And I don't think Israel is going to allow it to happen. Yeah. No, I, I don't think we can allow them to have nuclear weapons. Getting back to the economy for a minute, and we talked about this a little bit earlier, but you talked about Dodd-Frank and one of the rules that you, you, you're, not, you're not happy with the regulation that it puts on banks. But a lot of people would say that after what happened when the banks collapsed and when the economy collapsed, that some type of regulation needs to be in place. Do you think any type of regulation needs to be in place on big banks or on banks, period? I think... Uh that it comes down to, um, I think we had regulations in place. You know, I think we had federal auditors in our banks. I think we had regulations in place that should have, there were levels of, of protection, but from the rating agencies who obviously failed us, uh, to the insurance companies that their underwriting standards, uh, you know, it should have been looked at, or if they weren't, they were, I mean, they were too lax, and uh, there, was, there were five or six layers of protection that were in place. They just weren't enforced. <laughs> and then we had the federal government uh, insisting that banks make these, you know, community development loans to people who couldn't afford to pay them back. And then when the, when the house of cards collapsed, and they say, oh, gosh, how'd this happen? We need to apply more regulations. I don't think we needed more law. I think we needed to enforce the laws we had. And, you know, talk to bankers. <laughs> I haven't found a small banker yet that thinks Dodd-Frank was a good idea. Who doesn't think that, that Dodd-Frank uh, handcuffed their business? They're very concerned about, you know, the future and how they're going to handle this. And, and uh, talk to small business and see how it affected their access to capital. I'll tell you, they're not happy either. Uh, I think it's been, it's, it, it, it's almost like Obamacare in terms of a federal takeover of the banking system. Let's talk about unions. Your opponent is pro-union, and this is a state that is not pro-union, and as a result of that, we have a big Boeing plant in North Charleston. How do you, but how do you protect the workers? How do you protect the middle class? And that seems to be a, a big struggle on either side of the coin. What do you, how, do you, how do you approach that? Well, I, I think that, uh, that to be pro-union in this state is, is totally ridiculous. Uh, completely without merit. I think that the reason BMW came here, <laughs> I think one of the reasons is because we, are, we did not, we're a right to work state. I think one of the reasons that Boeing came here, one of the primary reasons is because we're a right to work state. Uh, and, and Continental and Goodyear and, uh, and Amazon and all these other companies that South Carolina is finally pulling in jobs. We've got a good, you know, pro-economic uh, development entity in the Department of Commerce. We got a good pro-economic development governor in Nikki Haley. Uh, she's already crossed the 25,000 job threshold in her very limited time as governor. She's following through on that campaign promise. Uh, and I think to, uh, to change from a right to work state would cut off that flow of jobs that we have coming into this state. And I think what takes care of the worker, what takes care of, uh, of the uh, uh, the wages and the benefits and all those other types of things is the market. It's, you know, supply and demand. If, if we can get more jobs in here and we can ha get an get a unemployment rate that's at or less than the national average, then employers will pay more to get the workers that they need. Okay. Let's take a, another break, and when we come back, I'm going to have you make your pitch to the voter why they should get your vote on November 6th. Sounds great. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Carolina this week. Tom Rice, my guest, uh, running for the 7th Congressional District seat. If you're just joining us, well, you get the most important part. He's going to make his pitch to you why you should vote for him come November 6th. I give you the floor. Well, uh, my priorities in this race are uh, jobs and economic development and 
to uh, stop the out of control growth in government and the out of control government spending. With respect to jobs and economic development, I ran on the same thing when I ran to be chairman of Horry County Council, and I didn't just say it, I've done it. We put into place an economic development corporation. We're getting interest in uh, uh, industries. Uh, we're, we're diversifying our in industrial base, and we're producing jobs very quickly in Horry County. And I think we can do the same thing at the national level. I think we can do the same thing throughout this district. So I don't just listen to what I say, look at what I do. With respect to the debt and deficit, obviously, uh, uh, it's completely out of control. We're borrowing $900 a month from each of our children and grandchildren. We're on an unsustainable path. We're bankrupting the country. And so I, I'll, I'll fight for a balanced budget amendment, and, uh, and I'll fight for a comprehensive plan to get us back on a path to a balanced budget. All right. Horry County Council Chairman Tom Rice running for the 7th Congressional District. Thanks for being with me this morning. And uh, I'll see you again on October 17th for the debate that uh, you'll be able to see between yourself and Gloria Bermel Tinubu, your Democratic challenger. And we will uh, we'll see you then, but I'll see you back here in just a minute. Stay with us.